Section 29 of A Popular History of France, Volume 5. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 5, by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 40. Louis XIII, Richelieu, Catholics and Protestants, Part 4. On the 29th of September, the English flag appeared before Saint-Martin-de-Ré. It was commanded by the Earl of Lindsay, and was composed of a hundred and forty vessels, which carried six thousand soldiers, besides the crews. The French, who were of the religion, were in the van, commanded by the Duke of Soubise and the Count of Laval, brother of the Duke of La Tremoille, who had lately renounced his faith in front of La Rochelle, being convinced of his errors by a single lesson from the cardinal. Quote, this armament was England's utmost effort, for the Parliament which was then being holden had granted six millions of livres to fit it out to avenge the affronts and ignominy which the English nation had encountered on the island of Ré, and afterwards by the shameful retreat of their armament in the month of May. But it was too late coming. The mole was finished, and the opening in it defended by two forts, and a floating palisade blocked the passage as well. The English sent some petards against this construction, but they produced no effect, and when next day they attacked the royal fleet, the French crews lost but twenty-eight men. Quote, the fire-ships were turned aside by men who feared fire as little as water. Lord Lindsay retired with his squadron to the shelter of the island of Esch, sending to the king quote, Lord Montague to propose some terms of accommodation. End quote. He demanded pardon for the Rochelaise, freedom of conscience, and quarter for the English garrison in La Rochelle. The answer was, quote, that the Rochelaise were subjects of the king, who knew quite well what he had to do with them, and that the king of England had no right to interfere. As for the English, they should meet with the same treatment as was received by the French whom they held prisoners. End quote. Montague set out for England to obtain further orders from the king his master. All hope of effectual aid was gone, and the Rochelaise felt it. The French who were on board the English fleet had taken, like them, a resolution to treat, and they had already sent to the cardinal when, on the 29th of October, the deputies from La Rochelle arrived at the camp. Quote, Your fellows who were in the English army have already obtained grace, said the cardinal to them, and when they were disposed not to believe it, the cardinal sent for the pastors Vincent and Gobert, late delegates to King Charles I. Quote, they embraced with tears in their eyes, not daring to speak of business, as they had been forbidden to do so on pain of death. The demands of the Rochelaise were more haughty than befitted their extreme case. Quote, Though they were but shadows of living men, and their life rested solely on the king's mercy, they actually dared, nevertheless, to propose to the cardinal a general treaty on behalf of all those of their party, including Madame de Rohan and Monsieur de Soubise, the maintenance of their privileges, of their governor, and of their mayor, together with the right of those bearing arms, to march out with beat of drum and lighted match, end quote, with the honours of war. The cardinal was amused at their impudence, he writes in his memoir, and told them that they had no right to expect anything more than pardon, which moreover they did not deserve. Quote, he was nevertheless anxious to conclude, wishing that Montague should find peace made, and that the English fleet should see it made without their consent, which would render the rest of the king's business easier, whether as regarded England or Spain, or in the interior of the kingdom. End quote. On the 28th, the treaty, or rather the grace, was accordingly signed, quote, the king granting life and property to those of the inhabitants of the town who were then in it, and the exercise of the religion within La Rochelle. End quote. These articles bore the signature of a brigadier-general, M. de Marillac, the king not having thought proper to put his name at the bottom of a convention made with his subjects. Next day, twelve deputies issued from the town, making a request for horses to Marshal de Bassompierre, whose quarters were close by, for they had not strength to walk. They dismounted on approaching the king's quarters, and the cardinal presented them to his majesty. Quote, Sir, said they, we do acknowledge our crimes and rebellions, and demand mercy promising to remain faithful for the future, if your majesty deigns to remember the services we were able to render to the king your father. End quote. The king gazed upon these suppliants, kneeling at his feet, deputies from the proud city which had kept him more than a year at her gates. Fleshless, almost fainting, they still bore on their features the traces of the haughty past. They had kept the lilies of France on their walls, refusing to the last to give themselves to England. Quote, better surrender to a king who could take La Rochelle than to one who couldn't succour her, said the mayor, John Guiton, who was asked if he would not become an English subject. 
quote, I know that you have always been malignants, said the king at last, and that you have done all you could to shake off the yoke of obedience to me. I forgive you nevertheless your rebellions, and will be a good prince to you, if your actions conform to your protestations. End quote. Thereupon he dismissed them, not without giving them a dinner, and sent victuals into the town, without which all that remained would have been dead of hunger within two days. The fighting men marched out, quote, the officers and gentlemen wearing their swords and the soldiery with bare or white staff in hand, end quote, according to the conventions. As they passed they were regarded with amazement, there not being more than sixty-four Frenchmen and ninety English, all the rest had been killed in sorties or had died of want the cardinal at the same time entered this city which he had subdued by sheer perseverance griton came to meet him with six archers he had not appeared during the negotiations saying that his duty detained him in the town quote, away with you said the cardinal and at once dismiss your archers taking care not to stall yourself mayor any more on pain of death End quote. griton made no reply and went his way quietly to his house a magnificent dwelling till lately but now lying desolate amidst the general ruin he was not destined to reside there long the heroic defender of la rochelle was obliged to leave the town and retire to tournay bouton he returned to la rochelle to die in sixteen fifty eight the king made his entry into the subjugated town on the first of november sixteen twenty eight it was full of corpses in the chambers the houses the public thoroughfares for those who still survived were so weak that they had not been able to bury the dead Madame de Rouen and her daughter, who had not been included in the treaty, were not admitted to the honor of seeing His Majesty, quote, for having been the brand that had consumed this people, end quote, they were sent to prison at Niort, quote, there kept captive, without exercise of their religion, and so strictly that they had but one domestic to wait upon them, all which, however, did not take from them their courage or wanted zeal for the good of their party the mother sent word to the duke of rohan her son that he was to put no faith in her letters since she might be made to write them by force and that no consideration of her pitiable condition should make her flinch to the prejudice of her party whatever harm she might be made to suffer memoire du duc de rohan page three ninety five worn out by so much suffering the old duchess of rohan died in sixteen thirty one at her castle du Père. she had been released from captivity by the pacification of the south with la rochelle fell the last bulwark of religious liberties single-handed duke henry of rohan now resisted at the head of a handful of resolute men but he was about to be crushed in his turn the capture of la rochelle had raised the cardinal's power to its height it had simultaneously been the death-blow to the huguenot party and to the factions of the grandees Quote, one of them was bold enough to say, on seeing that la rochelle was lost, now we may well say that we are all lost, End quote. Memoire de Richelieu. Upper Languedoc had hitherto refused to take part in the rising, and the Prince of Condé was advancing on Toulouse when the Duke of Rohan attempted a bold enterprise against Montpellier. He believed that he was sure of his communications with the interior of the town, but when the detachment of the advance guard got a footing on the drawbridge, the ropes that held it were cut, and, quote, the soldiers fell into a ditch, where they were shot down with arquebus, at the same time that musketry played upon them from without. End quote. The lieutenant fell back in all haste upon the division of the Duke of Rohan, who retreated quote, to the best villages between Montpellier and Lunel, without ever a man from Montpellier going out to follow and see whither he went. End quote. The war was wasting Languedoc, Vivray, and Rouergue the dukes of montmorency and ventadour under the orders of the prince of conde were pursuing the troops of rohan in every direction the burgesses of montauban had declared for the reformers and were ravaging the lands of their catholic neighbours in return for the frightful ruin everywhere caused by the royal troops the wretched peasantry laid the blame on the duke of rohan quote, for one of the greatest misfortunes connected with the position of party chiefs is this necessity they lie under of accounting for all their actions to the people that is to a monster composed of numberless heads amongst which there is scarcely one open to reason end quote. memoire de montmorency quote, whoso has to do with a people that considers nothing difficult to undertake, and as for the execution, makes no sort of provision, is apt to be much hampered, writes the Duke of Rohan in his memoir, page 376. It was this extreme embarrassment that landed him in crime. 
one of his emissaries returning from piedmont where he had been admitted to an interview with the ambassador of spain made overtures to him on behalf of that power quote, which had an interest he said in a prolongation of the hostilities in france so as to be able to peaceably achieve its designs in italy the great want of money in which the said duke then found himself the country being unable to furnish more and the towns being unwilling to do anything further there being nothing to hope from england and nothing but words without deeds having been obtained from the duke of savoy absolutely constrained him to find some means of raising it in order to subsist and so in the following year the duke of rohan treated with the king of spain who promised to allow him annually three hundred thousand ducats for the keep of his troops and forty thousand for himself in return the duke who looked forward to quote, the time when he and his might make themselves sufficiently strong to canton themselves and form a separate state end quote, promised in that state freedom and enjoyment of their property to all catholics a piece of strange and culpable blindness for which rohan was to pay right dearly it was in the midst of this cruel partisan war that the duke heard of the fall of la rochelle he could not find fault quote, with folk so attenuated by famine that the majority of them could not support themselves without a stick for having sought safety in capitulation end quote. but to the continual anxiety felt by him for the fate of his mother and sister was added disquietude as to the effect that this news might produce on his troops quote, the people weary of and ruined by the war and naturally disposed to be very easily cast down by adversity the tradesmen annoyed at having no more chance of turning a penny the burgesses seeing their possessions in ruins and uncultivated all were inclined for peace at any price whatever the prince of conde whilst cruelly maltreating the countries in revolt had elsewhere had the prudence to observe some gentle measures towards the peaceable reformers in the hope of thus producing submission he made this quite clear himself when writing to the duke of rohan quote, sir the king's express commands to maintain them of the religion styled reformed in entire liberty of conscience have caused me to hitherto preserve those who remain in due obedience to his majesty in all catholic places countries as well as towns in entire liberty justice has run its free course the worship continues everywhere save in two or three spots where it served not for the exercise of religion but to pave the way for rebellion the officers who came out of rebel cities have kept their commissions in a word the treatment of so-called reformers when obedient has been the same as that of catholics faithful to the king to which henry of rohan replied quote, i confess to have once taken up arms unadvisedly in so far as it was not on behalf of the affairs of our religion but of those of yourself personally who promised to obtain us reparation for the infractions of our treaties and you did nothing of the kind having had thoughts of peace before receiving news from the general assembly since that time everybody knows that i have had arms in my hands only from sheer necessity in order to defend our properties our lives and the freedom of our consciences i seek my repose in heaven and god will give me grace to always find that of my conscience on earth they say that in this war you have not made a bad thing of it this gives me some assurance that you will leave our poor uven at peace seeing that there are more hard knocks than pistoles to be got there the prince of conde avenged himself for this stinging reply by taking possession in brittany of all the duke of rohan's property which had been confiscated and of which the king had made him a present there were more pistoles to be picked up on the duke's estates than in Savennes. the king was in italy and the reformers hoped that his affairs would detain him there a long while but quote, god who had disposed it otherwise breathed upon all those projects end quote, and the arms of louis the thirteenth were everywhere victorious peace was concluded with piedmont and england without the latter treaty making any mention of the huguenots the king then turned his eyes towards languedoc and summoning to him the dukes of montmorency and schomberg he laid siege to privas the cardinal soon joined him there and it was on the day of his arrival that the treaty with england was proclaimed by heralds beneath the walls the besieged thus learned that their powerful ally had abandoned them without reserve at the first assault the inhabitants fled into the country the garrison retired within the forts and the king's soldiers penetrating into the deserted streets were able without resistance to deliver up the town to pillage and flames when the affrighted inhabitants came back by little and little within their walls they found the houses confiscated to the benefit of the king who invited a new population to inhabit privas town after town quote, fortified huguenot wise end quote, surrendered opening to the royal armies the passage to the uvennes 
the duke of rohan who had at first taken position at nimes repaired to anduze for the defence of the mountains the real fortress of the reformation in languedoc alais itself had just opened its gates rohan saw that he could no longer impose the duty of resistance upon a people weary of suffering quote, easily believing ill of good folks and readily agreeing with those whiners who blame everything and do nothing end quote. He sent, quote, to the king, begging to be received to mercy, thinking it better to resolve on peace, whilst he could still make some show of being able to help it, than to be forced, after a longer resistance, to surrender to the king with a rope round his neck, end quote. The cardinal advised the king to show the duke grace, quote, well knowing that, together with him individually, the other cities, whether they wished it or not, would be obliged to do the like, there being but little resolution and constancy in people deprived of leaders, especially when they are threatened with immediate harm, and see no door of escape open, end quote the general assembly of the reformers which was then in meeting at nimes removed to anduze to deliberate with the duke of rohan a wish was expressed to have the opinion of the province of the cevennes and all the deputies repaired to the king's presence no more surety towns fortifications everywhere raised at the expense and by the hands of the reformers the catholic worship re-established in all the churches of the reformed towns and at this price an amnesty granted for all acts of rebellion and religious liberties confirmed anew such were the conditions of the peace signed at alais on the twenty eighth of june sixteen twenty nine and made public the following month at nimes under the name of edict of grace montauban alone refused to submit to them the duke of rohan left france and retired to venice where his wife and daughter were awaiting him he had been appointed by the venetian senate generalissimo of the forces of the republic when the cardinal who had no doubt preserved some regard for his military talents sent him an offer of the command of the king's troops in the valtelline there he for several years maintained the honour of france being at one time abandoned and at another supported by the cardinal who ultimately left him to bear the odium of the last reverse meeting with no response from the court cut off from every resource he brought back into the district of gesh the french troops driven out by the grissons themselves and then retired to geneva being threatened with the king's wrath he set out for the camp of his friend duke bernard of saxe weimar and it was whilst fighting at his side against the imperialists that he received the wound of which he died in switzerland on the sixteenth of april sixteen thirty eight his body was removed to geneva amidst public mourning a man of distinguished mind and noble character often wild in his views and hopes and so deeply absorbed in the interests of his party and of his church that he had sometimes the misfortune to forget those of his country meanwhile the king had set out for paris and the cardinal was marching on montauban being obliged to halt at pezena because he had a fever he there received a deputation from montauban asking to have its fortifications preserved on the minister's formal refusal supported by a movement in advance on the part of marshal bassompierre with the army the town submitted unreservedly quote, knowing that the cardinal had made up his mind to enter in force they found this so bitter a pill that they could scarcely swallow it they nevertheless offered the dais to the minister as they had been accustomed to do to the governor but he refused it and would not suffer the consuls to walk on foot beside his horse bassompierre set guards at the door of the meeting-house that things might be done without interruption or scandal it was ascertained that the parliament of toulouse quote, habitually intractable in all that concerned religion end quote, had enregistered the edict without difficulty the gentlemen of the neighbourhood came up in crowds the reformers to make their submission and the catholics to congratulate the cardinal on the day of his departure the pickaxe was laid to the fortifications of montauban those of castres were already beginning to fall and the huguenot party in france was dead deprived of the political guarantees which had been granted them by henry the fourth the reformers had nothing for it but to retire into private life this was the commencement of their material prosperity they henceforth transferred to commerce and industry all the intelligence courage and spirit of enterprise that they had but lately displayed in the service of their cause on the battlefield or in the cabinets of kings Quote, from that time says cardinal richelieu difference in religion never prevented me from rendering the huguenots all sorts of good offices and i made no distinction between frenchmen but in respect of fidelity a grand assertion true at bottom in spite of the frequent grievances that the reformers had often to make the best of the cardinal was more tolerant than his age and his servants what he had wanted to destroy was the political party he did not want to drive the reformers to extremity nor force them to fly the country 
Happy had it been if Louis the Fourteenth could have listened to and borne in mind the instructions given by Richelieu to Count de Sceaux, commissioned to see after the application in Dauphiny of the Edicts of Pacification. Quote, I hold that, as there is no need to extend in favor of them of the religion styled reformed, that which is provided by the edicts, so there is no ground for cutting down the favors granted them thereby. Even now, when, by the grace of God, peace is so firmly established in the kingdom, too much precaution cannot be used for the prevention of all those discontents amongst the people. I do assure you that the king's veritable intention is to have all his subjects living peaceably in the observation of his edicts, and that those who have authority in the provinces will do him service by conforming thereto. End quote. The era of liberty passed away with Henry the Fourth. That of tolerance for the reformers began with Richelieu, pending the advent with Louis the Fourteenth of the day of persecution. End of section twenty nine. End of chapter forty.